Gardner CBS News correspondent, Charlie Rose. Welcome back. There are computers, and then there are computers. And just as the family auto is quite a bit different in performance from a top racing car, there are vast differences in computer capabilities. And in the tradition of racing, we'd like to take a look at what the best computers can do at full throttle. What we're talking about here are supercomputers, and their amazing feats have applications in medicine, science, the weather, and other areas of fundamental importance to humankind. The United States' most advanced supercomputer to date is the Cray-2 at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Dr. Larry Smarr is the director of the center. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you are, this is interesting, your full title is Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Illinois at, Ur at the Urbana-Champaign and is that right, Urbana yes. Champaign, mm -hmm. and then director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, you are, by training, an astrophysicist. That's right. I've been using supercomputers for some 20 years to try to solve for what goes on in the heavens. And if I remember about reading of you, you're only about 41 or 42. Is that Just about Just past 40. Okay. I'm, over, I'm over the hill. You can't trust me any longer. <laughs> what do we mean by supercomputer? Well, it's a moving target. The supercomputer is simply the fastest, largest memory computer that you can buy at any given time. Now, as years go by, the chips get smaller, the machines get faster and faster and faster, and so what you can buy for, say, $20 million is typically the fastest machine at any given time. Our Cray-2, for instance, our Cray-XMP, are both machines made by the Cray Research uh, a corporation that uh, have about a thousand times the speed of, say, a personal computer and about a thousand times the memory. Yeah. Now this, for instance, this computer watch with its little keyboard on it, this is as fast as the supercomputer of, say, 30 years ago. Wow. And yet you can get it for $35 in the drugstore. 30 years ago? It would have cost $20 million. Yeah. What does a supercomputer cost today? Uh, typically, it's, it's staying at about 20 to $30 million uh, year by year. So the, the point is that if you have $20 million and you wait five years from now, you'll get a lot more supercomputer for your dollar. Because each year, computers deflate in price. That is, you get more power every year. You see that in the personal computers, right? Every yeah. time you go down to buy one, there's some new thing on it. It does full color now, or it can go much faster than before, and yet it's getting cheaper. Let, let me turn to how they are different, it, other than, than, than the speed of what right. they do and in the cost. Are they also supercomputers capable of more functions? Actually, they're very similar computers? to the personal computers. That is, they have, uh, my five-year-old and seven-year-olds always want to say, where's the keyboard on the yeah. supercomputer? It, typically, you use your personal computer, and then you talk, say, through a modem or over a phone line to the supercomputer, but the supercomputer has a memory, it has a processing unit, just like a personal computer. What's the significance of a supercomputer? Well, it allows you to attack the problems that are as complex in their mathematics as nature is in the real world. So, in some of the things we'll see a little bit later, you'll see the ability to take the laws of physics that we've been finding for 300 years since Newton that are just mathematical statements, when you put them into a supercomputer, they become living solutions. You see thunderstorms develop. You right. see uh, molecules in solution. So it's, it's an ability to solve these equations for the way nature works. See, as scientists, we really believe this crazy stuff that mathematics describes the world. We don't have any understanding of why that happens. But it's a miracle. It does happen. Mm -hmm. And so the computer is so fast, it can do a billion 13-digit multiplies every second. That's like every man, woman, and child in the United States multiplying five 13-digit numbers every second. Wow. Okay. Let me take a look at these. We've got some 3D supercomputer pictures, and it shows some of what a supercomputer can do. If we'll show the first one, you describe it for me. What you're Dr. seeing Smart. is two neutron stars colliding head-on in space as the supercomputer would calculate it. No telescope could ever see something this far away and this small. Each of these neutron stars is about the mass of the sun and the size of maybe Washington, D.C. And as they collide, the, each of those particles you're seeing is being 
computed, its trajectory in space and time is being computed by the supercomputer. And then we are taking this and putting it into sort of a souped up personal computer, which visualizes, turns those numbers into a picture. So if you were, a few years ago, we didn't have scientific visualization. Right. And so what would come out of the computer? Well, you've seen it, green paper with numbers on it. And right there, you probably saw 100,000 numbers every frame, and you saw maybe 16 frames a second. If, you'd have, if I'd have brought in a stack of paper this big and given you the same numbers that you just saw turned into images, yeah. how much understanding would you have gotten? Very little. And yet that's the way almost all scientists are still doing their work with computers. Wow. This visualization revolution is actually taking the technology that TV pioneered. The way that we recorded those pictures after they were calculated turned on to say like a personal computer and you saw individual color images is we used an abacus which is the device Monday night football uses or Sunday football to do slow-mo replays. You know, let's see where that guy stepped out of the line. You know, let's yeah. run it back. Run it. We put those on the same exact device that you would have like in your recording studio here. We move, we, we can control the speed. The scientist sits down with a video post-production specialist and then we can create for him this this visualization into what he calculated. It's really transforming the way humans interact with computers. The next thing we're going to see is a tornado developing. Go ahead and explain right. this to me as, as we look at the picture. What, what you have here are the laws that govern um, the atmosphere. And you're seeing work done by Robert Wilhelmson and wow. his colleagues at Illinois. This is the surface of the water in that thunderstorm, again, purely mathematically calculated. Mm -hmm. You divide all of space up into little boxes. You can, if you look closely, you'll see them on the surface of this storm. And the computer just carries the wind velocity and the pressure and the temperature in each of those boxes. And then the visualization expert uh, that we have at our center, we have a whole crew of people that, that work with the scientists, turn those into these images and you can see it it looks extremely realistic those hook cloud you see on the corner is what would lead wow. to a tornado back in a moment stay with us dr larry smart We're back with Dr. Uh, professor, Dr. Larry Smart, professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Illinois, and he's also director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. We talked about what the supercomputer can do, and we talked about visualization. We saw the tornado, and we also saw uh, the collision of the two neutron stars. Roll tape, now we will see an enzyme reaction, which is important because it visualizes for scientists what is happening to molecules inside a test tube. Right. Pick up the story. This is, this is using the supercomputer now to go down and calculate atom by atom, the interaction of molecules, that what you see there is, is the individual atoms are little balls with sticks holding them together is the representation of the forces. And now that purple transparent surface shows you the electrical influence that an individual molecule has. And all of this is sitting in a bath of water molecules and the, and the location and velocity and the oscillation of all those molecules are being calculated from first principles by the supercomputer turned into visualization pictures by our people at the center. Why are they different colors? Uh, they represent the different chemical elements. For instance, the, the red with the two little white balls on it, that's H2O. The, yeah. the red is oxygen and the two little whites are hydrogen, that's water. So we have uh, the ability to actually take these new drugs, proteins and so forth, put them into a water solution in mathematically on the computer and compute what a chemist couldn't see in his test tube. What's the most exciting supercomputing application that's on the frontier that you think offers the most hope for mankind? I, I would have to say it's in drug design. The, Designing drugs that can do what? Well, we are going to see a total revolution in medicine uh, in the next several decades. Uh, we are going to use supercomputers to help along with the laboratory equipment to uncode the entire human genome, the DNA that sits in everyone's cells and completely determines their makeup. Yeah. There are three billion little stair steps on the double helix that yeah. makes up right. DNA. Right. That three billion, that means when you begin to shift it around and compare it, you're gonna need a cray. You're gonna need something to make yeah. billions only, of... Only with a giant computer can you understand all right. this. 
permutation combinations and all that. And what we will be able to do from that is, is that will tell us the individual genes that go wrong, for instance, in gen all genetic diseases. So if we know someone who has a, is, is a predisposed to a certain genetic disease and through the computer we can understand what part of their DNA makeup causes that genetic predisposition, right. we can go in and change it, replace it, do something with it, alter it in some way? That's right. And, the, and what the DNA does, that genetic component of, of your cells, it makes proteins. And that's everything that you're made of. Muscles and blood cells and everything else are basically yeah. made of molecules called proteins. The idea is to be able to then design those proteins with the computer. Take a drug company. A drug company has to go through, on the average, of 10,000 different compounds to find one that makes it to the marketplace. 10,000 to find one. That's, that's right. It's a, be a it's, product. It's, it's a needle in the haystack. And what supercomputers can do is compute very well. rapidly. They can help the chemist, instead of having to go through the laborious laboratory test with test tubes and animals and rats and, 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 and test out those 10,000, it can scan through them, compute whether this wing would be effective or not, and very rapidly bring that down to say a hundred, which then you can instead of taking many years, maybe it would only it would take much less time to 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 find that needle. You just returned from three weeks in Japan. Why do people say whoever wins the race for the best supercomputer will dominate world trade? Because what we're seeing today, and we particularly see this at our center, where we have major industrial partners like Kodak, Amico, Eli Lilly and Company, Motorola. They are coming to our center to learn how to use these supercomputers in the basic manufacturing process. They actually can take the, we were over at General Motors the other day. Well, there they cast drums, brake drums on cars, and they have maybe 30 or 40 percent wastage. Well, if we could use a supercomputer to simulate that molten material coming into the mold, we could find a way to optimize it so that their waste was less. That means they'd make a more efficient product. They could sell it at a cheaper price. They is could... it... Go ahead. So that, so that what we're seeing is the supercomputer is becoming an aid to manufacturing itself, much less to all the service industries and so forth. It allows you to, to get out. It's, it's like a giant Lotus spreadsheet. I mean, what Lotus has done for, for businesses to make everyone able to do huge accounting problems they couldn't possibly do by hand, the supercomputer now lets you take the entire research, development, and manufacturing phase, not just the bookkeeping phase of industry, and computerize it. Is it true, now this is in the back of my head somewhere, and it may be wrong, so if, just tell me if it is. Did you have to go to West Germany or somewhere to work on a supercomputer to get access to, to one? To an American-built supercomputer. To an American-built. Now, why is that? And does that, what does that say about America? America and is that history? America has, I think, had some difficulties in getting its priorities straight on the use of computers um, until the National Science Foundation and Congress made an initiative three years ago to get these supercomputers accessible to our best minds in universities. And, and in industry. Uh, the only place that, that, that the federal government was really putting much money was in nuclear weapons design in the Livermore and Los Alamos right. laboratories. And in the 70s, that's where I had to go to get access uh, to these machines. That is, uh, we just didn't have, the federal government did not, from 1970 until 1985, provide the funds to universities necessary to keep them at the leading edge. Who's going to win the race, do you think? Give me your best guess. If America responds as it has before, World War II, the Apollo program, right. really national crises, to this challenge, who can take the computers and use them? Who can put them into their schools? Who can put them into their industries first? Who can create a trained manpower pool that knows how to use these, that can walk in seven league boots? That country will win. It could be us, it could be Japan. It's a question of national will and national focus. The Japanese are very clear. This is a technology that's going to give them the competitive They've edge. They've made the commitment. They've made the commitment in 1980. Our country, three years ago, began to make a commitment. In industry, I see that commitment is still not made. Odds are against us are better than 50-50? I think if the United States does not make a dramatic, a dramatic move to, to really get industry working together with the government to 
get these supercomputers and these visualizations in the hands of our, of our workers and researchers in the next year, right, two at the outside, then we will lose the race. With all the consequences that we've talked about. Dr. Larry, Dr. Larry Smart, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Illinois at the Urbana-Champaign uh, office and director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. You hear the warning, America. Night Watch continues back in a moment.